What does it mean to be a Blue Angel? It is a position of humility. It's a position that I'm very lucky to be a part of. It's a position that I never dreamed that I would actually be able to achieve, that I just never wanted to stop until I was able to achieve it. I've been growing up in Houston. Uh, I went to an air show and I was four years old with my dad in Fort Worth, Texas. And I saw the Blue Angels fly up there and I was like, that's very, very fun, very cool. I want to be like them one day. I, I want to go to the Naval Academy or do something in regards to the military service, uh, something greater than myself. So I applied to the, or I went to the summer seminar at the Naval Academy. I didn't actually apply to the Naval Academy. I pulled my application process as I found out I wanted to have a little bit more normal of a college experience. I went to Texas A&M University and College Station. I studied psychology of all things. In my sophomore year, I started meeting with some professors and uh, learning more about what the military actually entailed for me. And I, I remember back to when I was four years old and that dream about flying airplanes with uh, and seeing the Blue Angels fly over Fort Worth. And I, I just didn't want to stop there. So I just continued. I, I signed the contract. I joined the Marine Corps. You go through officer candidate school. I went after my junior year. It's a 10-week course in Quantico, Virginia. After you graduate, they send you through the basic school, which is a six to seven month course in Quantico, Virginia to learn the basics of leading a rifle platoon uh, through through combat exercises. Ultimately, it's a six, six and a half month leadership course about how to uh, be a Marine officer. And then once you complete that six months, you then go to flight school. And uh, for us, there's a little bit of a weight on the Marine Corps side. So they sent me through a six month Russian language course in uh, Virginia as well. So I learned Russian for six months. Finally got to Pensacola to start flying. So from the date I realized or signed the contract to become a Marine aviator in uh, 2007, it was 2011 before I actually hit flight school. So four years later for me as a Marine. Uh, and then I didn't get winged until 2013 out of Kingsville. So just like everybody on the team here, and the, uh, the other five, six pilots that we have, uh, both in the demo and not, everybody's done some sort of deployment. So for me, my personal story is I got to the AVAP Harrier community, I went to the training squadron for about a year, uh, and then my very first fleet squadron, VMA 231, the Ace of Spades out of Cherry Point, North Carolina. I went on a boat deployment with them on the USS Iwo Jima, and then I went on a combat deployment, uh, land-based, I should say, out of Bahrain, uh, and did the Operation Inherent Resolve, that whole campaign there. So Blue Angels, as, as I kind of alluded to earlier, it was kind of an ultimate dream about becoming a naval aviator and a jet pilot and an attack air type of a pilot there. So uh, going Harriers, I knew that it was an uphill battle. I knew that was a big uphill battle. There had only been one guy before me coming from the Harrier community, and that was Ben Hancock Lawman. Uh, and he was actually in the Ace of Spades as well. So he was the only other Harrier guy. So I knew the odds were stacked against me. Uh, the other plane that I definitely wanted to fly in my career was the F-35. So at selection process in 2013, the F-35 wasn't being selected out of flight school. So I knew that uh, I wanted to fly that plane. So at the first available opportunity, I went ahead and, and put in an application and uh, tried to get selected the F-35. So luckily I got picked up on my first time uh, applying and I went ahead and, uh, and started flying the F-35 for two and a half years. As an F-35 pilot, I finally started to think I might have a chance to join this team. Now I had done the Harrier thing, now I had done something that had proven that not just an attack community, but a little bit more of a fighter community. And maybe that could boost uh, my resume just a little bit in the eyes of the team. So uh, first chance I got, I started talking. It was Daryl Mullins on the team at the time. I knew him from, uh, from Bahrain, we had met over there. Uh, and he told me some good guidance and I, I just kind of ran with it and just didn't stop there. Uh, and ultimately put in my package for the team and lucky enough got picked up my first time. As soon as I got picked up on the team in July, I had to go straight to uh, San Diego to learn how to fly the Hornet. I'd never flown the Hornet before, so I went through a 28-day crash course in how to fly the plane. Uh, two weeks of ground school or so and some simulators, and then I went on the road quite a bit. We did a lot of cross countries on the weekends and during the week. So I was able to get 32 hours and 28 days to include NATOPS check and the ground school and the simulators. It was fast and furious. And then you do your first flight in a blue jet like the next week or so, uh, and it was terrifying. I was like, you know, I've, I've flown this plane just a little bit and now I'm getting in a blue jet that I've always dreamed about uh, and I literally have no expectations. I just don't want to make a fool of myself and I'm so nervous and then you go fly and it's a very, very cool experience to kind of get your feet wet and fly in a blue jet. And then sure enough, drop a salute happens in November and now you're the subject matter expert at the three spot for me, the number three pot, the left wingman. Never flown it before, but now everybody's asking me about the left wing spot. So it's a, a huge jump in your knowledge base. And so you really just have to take every ounce as 
studying time, spare time, just devote it into, into becoming the best that you can be in this, wearing this blue suit. The first winter training was a little different, I would say, because that's right when COVID started to happen. And we go out to El Centro, California. Eye opener out there. We get out there and it's six days a week, two to three flights a day for two and a half straight months. It doesn't feel like work. It feels like something that you've always wanted to do that you just have the time to devote yourself to doing. So the flights, the studying, the debriefs, the briefs, everything that you're doing out there, it's something, at least for me, that I wanted to do. So it never felt like I was going to work. It never felt like I was um, having to force myself to do something on these long days. And then time just kind of flies by in that sense. You, get, you start on a Monday morning and then by Saturday evening, you're like, that was six days of flying and I only had like a grand total of six hours of free time that entire week. Where did it all go? But you never, it was, it was just fun. It was a fun experience. We got to experience the start of COVID uh, and COVID kind of halted our air show season for 2020. And so that's where we started developing a, our new game plan of how we can accomplish our mission in 2020. So that was good for me to see. It was good for me to see how we train for an air show demonstration, yet that's our mission, is community outreach and, and flight demonstrations. So how can we best execute that mission in a different capacity? And so that's when we started kind of exploring different options. The Thunderbirds came in, we, we definitely explored some options with them. And that's how we came across the Operation America Strong. So Operation America Strong for us was our little way that we could give back to the community. And then the United States of America, every single first responder out there that any, actually every single person out there that had to give up their normal daily routine and change what they were doing because of a pandemic that was affecting the world at that time. Every single person's lives were changed uh, in 2020 in some capacity, uh, whether it was the actual COVID virus or whether it was um, changing how your company did business or what, how we changed our own mission set. Every single person to some capacities, uh, lifestyle was modified just a little bit. So I thought it was very, very awesome that we were able to go around to all these different cities. And in our small way of just flying an airplane, we were able to give a salute to all those first responders and just show our love and support uh, back to those local communities. To go over to New York City and Philadelphia and DC, go down to all these cities across the nation, Detroit, where you're literally seeing a, f a car manufacturing factory that had stopped production on vehicles and parts and went to start making masks and ventilators, like things like that. They're just eye-opening. All these stories that you hear and we were just very, very lucky to provide our little way to give back to the community by flying an airplane. My first year to fly the Legacy Hornet, I uh, got a very, very good opportunity to fly that plane. And we went through the entire show season, or season, I should say, doing Operation America Strong, practicing the demo, polishing up whatever we could, flying that plane, and really looking forward to that Super Hornet how we could affect a change in that transition from that legacy Hornet into the Super Hornet. So going out and flying those last couple flights in that plane, seeing us kind of sun down an entire era of Blue Angel demonstrations in that uh, F-18 Hornet, and now ushering in a new era of the Super Hornet was extremely lucky for me to even be here to be a part of that that whole transition. I'm very grateful for that opportunity. And to be able to learn the Super Hornet, much bigger platform, much more energy uh, behind those energies uh, that can be produ produced back there. So it was, it was fascinating uh, learning the different control laws between the planes, how they each handle. You know, the Legacy Hornet was very responsive. You put the stick somewhere and they would just hold it. And now the Super Hornet, it's trying to compensate. It uses different commands. The fly-by-wire commands, the controls are just slightly different than the control-by-wire that we flew in the F-18 Hornet. So knowing those nuances and learning how to apply those into a demonstration flight was a uh, was pretty cool experience. Ladies and gentlemen, the McDonnell Douglas F-A-18 Hornet. 8017 was fantastic because they had the platform transition. Boss Rude and a couple of the team members, we definitely reached back to them. Uh, some things that they learned, some uh, best practices that they introduced, or some, some things that they came across that other teams hadn't come across from their platform transition. We definitely reached back to them. And even the 34 network that I reached back to, every single person provides some sort of input. Uh, even Cowboy Anderson coming out to Greybeards this year, he was able to provide input and lessons learned that he had that 
who knows, he may not think that they had any sort of value, but they do. And those little things that we never knew about, you learn from the stories and the pass down from guys, your previous guys that had your position, previous guys on the team. So those things are invaluable to get the input from uh, former team members uh, to be able to make our current team better, or just understand the why as to what we do. The, the 75th anniversary is also the introduction of Super Hornet. To have those two lined up at the same time, which is not purely coincidence, I mean, kind of planned, but those two things hand in hand, I think were quite, quite a year. And we had a fantastic team. We all got along very, very well. And to kind of see that kind of transpire through the end of the year was, was fascinating. And I love the three spot, don't get me wrong. Like it is more natural to fly in the three spot now than it is to fly anywhere else in the entire demonstration after doing two years of it. But now shifting from that, where your only job was to not move and fly your set and balance whatever two is doing, uh, to now the four spot, where you're constantly moving, you're constantly adjusting your position, you're constantly looking at everything around you, you're assessing where the solos are in their timing pattern, you're assessing where we are to adjust your cheat, you're backing up boss on safety calls or altitudes, you're backing up roll rates, you're doing a lot more than you ever could as a three pilot because your visibility is better. As a three pilot, you really only look this way. A few chances you get to kind of look through the formation or to out a breakout type of maneuver to see the environment, but your only job is to look at a couple letters and just not move and now to see everything that's going on around it to have your essay bubble just just grow exponentially in the period of one year and then to also try to impart whatever knowledge you gained from your last year or two flying in, in the left wing to help train new wingmen or a new boss for next year's four uh, that is that's something absolutely critical to the four spot the double farvel from the four spot, that's definitely one that everybody talks about and every four has their own unique challenges with. It's never uh, natural to fly inverted in close formation to another airplane. Uh, so kind of getting that one, finding the position. The other thing that I've learned in the Super Hornet is the, the jet wash behind the jet is a lot bigger. That cone of dirty air is a lot bigger behind the Super Hornet. And so to find that position, to be able to find the stepped up position or outside position that you need to be able to roll in and then increase the power to be able to get into positions is uh, very unique. So the maintenance team, they do a lot of things that don't go, uh, a lot of it seems to go unnoticed, I should say. But those guys are working nonstop and it's something that every single officer, at least that, that I am aware of, is very appreciative of. How hard they are working behind the scenes is something that, that we truly appreciate. The fact that we can go out on any given day and have jets to fly that are safe jets and we know they're safe is uh, something very, uh, very unique to this team. Uh, the, the fact that we can have jets that go, that break on us, and then just a couple hours later, we're back to having a full six plane demo. I think that's pretty, pretty unique to this maintenance team, the abilities to flex that this team has. And so to me, being a Blue Angel, it is an absolute position of you're representing those around you. You, you always want to be the best at what you can be and that you have this unique privilege to inspire those around you that, that a lot of members of the military don't necessarily get. And then I get to go out and meet members of the community and kids and to hopefully pass a little bit of inspiration onto them so that they can accomplish whatever, whatever they wanna do in their own lives, whether it's join the military or whether it's become a teacher or become a football player, whatever their dream is. And those are uh, absolutely very, very lucky moments for me. Something I'll remember for the rest of my life.